Hi everyone, I'm, I'm Yulia Tudor, leading on, um, on investor engagement here at Digital Catapult, um, and I'll be your host um, for the day. Um, thanks a lot and welcome to our fundraising in um, Challenging Times webinar. Um, for those of you that don't know us, Digital Catapult is a government-backed innovation center that supports the early adoption of advanced technologies. As such, we work very closely with the government, corporates, um, startups and scale-ups, academia and research, and the investment community um, to help boost UK's economy. Times like this reveal the power of collaboration and mutual support to overcome the most extreme and unexpected challenges. We are here at Digital Catapult committed to supporting a number of national initiatives um, in response to COVID-19 um, virus outbreak. And we will do whatever we can do to continue using our in-house expertise um, and our ecosystem to assist these efforts and more. Um, just a few notes on um, housekeeping before we start, just to ensure that we all have a great experience. Um, so please note that this session is, is recorded. So if you drop out um, or for any reason have to um, leave, we will share the recording um, afterwards. Um, for all the attendees, your camera is switched off um, and microphone is muted, uh, but we'd love to actually hear from you. So please submit um, your questions um, using the Q&A box. Um, and, um, you should also see the, the questions that are being asked by other attendees. Please upvote because towards the end, we'll, um, we'll, we'll switch to Q&A and it's just gonna make it a lot easier for us to choose from, um, from the most voted um, questions. Um, I'm very glad today to, to be joined by um, Peter Carley, President of European Business um, Angels Network, um, a serial entrepreneur and angel investor. Um, Carmen, uh, who's a partner at Summit Pada PC, um, and European seed, um, seed Fund, and Ed Lassels, um, partner at Albion VC, a Series A fund. Um, so I'd like to first ask every, every single one of our panelists to actually say, like do a one minute intro um, to themselves, the funds, um, and then we're gonna dive into, into the questions that um, our attendees today have prepared. Um, Peter, do you wanna go first as you're like on the angel side? Yeah, I can do, yeah. I was gonna suggest beauty before age, but I'll stop. <laughs> Uh, and Carmen's not on yet, unfortunately, <laughs> uh, but I hope she's on shortly. Anyway, so my background is uh, engineer, engineering and computer science at uni um, some time ago, entrepreneur in technology and property over the years, and I've still got two entrepreneurial businesses. Um, uh, I, um, my first business was in Germany. I've founded or co-founded 14 businesses in total. Um, I stumbled into ancient investing about 12 years ago when I invested in a small business in Cambridge and exited quite quickly. And then I found an organization called the Cambridge Angels, which I joined and I've been a member of now for a decade, I was chair of that for three years. And in fact, Ed is one of our members as well, um, corporate members. Um, on top of that, I have a role as president of the, the European Business Angel Network, which means I have an overview of what's happening within Europe. That's a trade body for Europe. I published a couple of, written and published a couple of books, invested, invested and founder to founder. And I've done over 70 investments of which I've got about 50 or so left. I've had eight exits, positive exits, 14 failures. One of the latest positive exit was um, actually paid back everything I've invested, the so-called dragon in VC terms, which means now everything after this is positive. Uh, lots going on in my portfolio at the moment, which I'm sure we'll cover in the next 50 odd minutes. Ed. Great. Yeah, I'll let Carmen sort of get... Hi, Carmen. Uh, I'll just... I'm it... sorry, Emily. That was... <laughs> Um, I have no excuse. Yeah, no, that's right. So um, just while you're getting stuff together. So yeah, I'm uh, Ed Lassels. I'm a partner at Albion. I've been uh, with Albion for 15 years. Um, and uh, so Albion um, has been investing for 25 years. We've made 200 investments. We've got 52 companies in our portfolio at the moment. Um, and we principally focus on investing in UK software companies at Series A. Um, we will look at all all companies, um, but you know, there are definitely some sectors we like. We like fintech, cyber, digital health, uh, martech, um, and have a, a theme at the moment that we, we particularly love around sort of data businesses, particularly full stack data businesses. Um, we also invest in some marketplaces, um, and then we do also run the UCL Technology Fund. So via that fund, we also invest that seed stage in deep tech, um, principally life sciences and computer science. 
Um, but yeah, ma mainly software companies at Series A. Carmen. Hi, so my name is, is Carmen. I'm a partner at Samaipata MVC. We're a pre-series A fund investing in digital platforms and marketplaces. And I'll briefly explain what we mean by that. With an office in London, which I lead, an office in, Fran in Paris to invest in France, and an office in Madrid to invest in Southern Europe. So when we say pre-series A, we basically mean rounds of one up to four million. Sweet spot is one to three million. We tend to can invest 500K to 2.5 million, but our sweet spot is one to 1.5 million and we eat the rounds. When I say digital platforms and marketplaces, I guess interesting for you to understand why we're specialized. So the three partners of the fund, we've all been founders of marketplaces. So there's a bit of an operating experience there that explains why but mainly because we believe in what we call is the rise of platforms. And for us, the rise of platform, a platform is any digital framework that enables the interaction between multiple sites. And we, so taking a step back on our thesis, we invest in European leaders that can become global tech leaders. So they need to be scalable and they need to be defensible. And we believe that platforms are the model that can disrupt many of the, that can help disrupt many of the um, sectors that we look at because they're both scalable and defensible through the network effects. So that is kind of our thesis of, of why we invest in digital platforms and, um, and marketplaces. Thanks a lot, Carmen, um, Ed and Peter for, um, for, the, for the intros. Um, as a reminder to the late joiners, um, if you have any questions, please pop them into the Q&A box. Um, we will filter those um, towards the end of the conversation. Um, so please also make sure to uh, vote each, um, each other's um, questions as well. And we are also recording, um, recording this session. So if you drop at any point, uh, we're, we'll be sharing this with you afterwards. <coughs> um, so let's dive into, into, into the panel. Um, and I'd like to actually start with, with a hard question, um, just to take it off, off the table. Um, so as you probably all know, um, the government has responded quickly with different initiatives in, in support of businesses um, impacted by the outbreak. Um, and we are aware that these initiatives are not covering all types of businesses um, and that there's more that they could do, especially for the early stage companies, but action is, is being taken. At, at the same time, um, I, I believe that over the past two weeks, um, investors keep saying that, you know, there's business as usual. Um, and indeed some private investors are still deploying their funds um, in, into tech startups. And we've seen some um, new investments being announced. However, um, I, I guess the first quarter of 2020 from an investment point of view is lower than previous years. Um, so I guess the important question that um, a lot of people um, have asked is that, is there such um, an expectation that the UK government will step in um, to underwrite investment into, into tech startups? And, and I guess, what is the role of the investment um, um, community to ensure that we, we keep this high growth um, potential tech companies going? Um, Peter, would, would you like to go first, especially again, like kind of from like an angel point of view, and then we go into seat and, and, and series A. Okay, I mean, that is a very long question with multiple answers. I'll try and keep this short to give time for the others. So first of all, um, let's talk about the government in a moment. First of all, certainly in our ecosystem in Cambridge, uh, and my investments are about 70% in Cambridge, 30% in London and Oxford, uh, this sort of business as usual in principle. So this means that we are still looking at new deals as organisations. I'm not at the moment because I've got to, and I put this on my website, because I'm just, I have to cope with all the onslaught of all the companies, say my portfolio with help, et cetera, and money where possible. But I'm still, you know, will, it, you know, I will look at new deals. Now, the issue will be that it takes time. Uh, it'll take longer than normal to raise money at this point. One, well, for two main reasons. One, because generally, uh, because investors at my stage, the early stage, are not investing in businesses as such, they're investing in people. And getting to know those people is more difficult over a Zoom or a, a WebEx call than it is face to face. And so it's, it feels like these deals will sort of stretch out until probably there's been a face to face meeting. But of course, during that time, a lot can happen in terms of pitching and getting to know companies. So that's the first point. 
the other point is that valuations are really difficult to forecast because like everybody, like the exit strategy that's talked about, we really don't know how long this is going to go on for. We don't know what point business will recover. We don't know what point, you know, um, you know whether there's going to be another wave and all the other things. So certainly convertible loans or, convert or ASAs in the EIS world are going to be used more. So they're just sort of kicking down the line, that rather difficult valuation question. So in principle, yes, it's still possible and all entrepreneurs should continue to seek capital. But uh, uh, there's a question come up actually in Q&A and I'm sort of partly answering that three months is too short. Do not assume you can close anything in that time. For those who have already got investments, it's a different matter because then the investors are obviously rallying around one hopes to help them and put more capital in with the same proviso that if, if, if the risk is unknown, which you said he is in, in for the time being, what valuation does one go for? So all is not lost, certainly, but it's much more difficult. Just briefly on government, there's all kinds of schemes going on. I've been talking to Treasury. Uh, I was talking to a local fund here in Cambridge. They want to put three million to early stage. They don't have to do it. So there's lots going on. The, uh, the Brent Hoveman thing, the um, well, startups. The government doesn't really know quite yet how to do this. They don't know how to put something in very rapidly and regret it. But I would suspect on top of the business loans, which my companies can't usually go for because they're not profitable, uh, and the furloughing, which they are doing, many of them, actually getting some equity down it is going to take longer before it comes from central government. I'll hand over. Thanks a lot, Peter. Carmen, would you like to go next? Sure, absolutely. So I think a lot of the points um, have been um, touched on by Peter, but I'll try to explain kind of how a VC thinks about the current situation and also how it has impacted a VC, right? And, or, or a fund like, like ours, and, and it changes by the day and, and the week. So that's also very important to understand that what we say today might be completely um, not, not different or not, but just not as valid or, or applicable in, in a couple of weeks. But basically when this whole situation first started, the first thing you have to worry about, as Peter said, is your portfolio. So it, um, all in all, let me start. I think things are still happening. They're just much slower and VCs are much more selective. So it's like things have slowed down, but they have slowed down because of several factors. One, because we all run to go and either help or see if our portfolio needed help and try to help them getting ready for whatever it is and um, be the impact uh, of, of, of this situation and, and help and the post-COVID world, right? So that was one and that obviously took some bandwidth. That is dying down now as in like our companies operate by themselves and, and things and people are getting easily um, or adapting easily to, to the new situation. Now, the second thing you also need to take into account is how ABC works and, and the capital calls. And there are some funds that every time they commit to a deal need to ask their LPs for money. Well, it is true that in the past few weeks, it hasn't been the best environment to do that. So that also has made people more cautious to committing. And the third and foremost one is the most important is the uncertainty. As, as Peter was saying, it is very hard for us now to price that risk. Like we, we price risk when we like invest in companies very, very early at a specific valuation, assuming they'll grow into it. Right now, uncertainty is such that it is very difficult to price it in. So it's very difficult to feel comfortable with, with valuations. And fourth, um, as Zoom or whether we can invest in a, in, in a company that we haven't really met is a question that is um, keeping, like the VCs are discussing a lot with each other. I do think we will get to that point. I think we have adapted very quickly to a world we would have never imagined we would have to live through. I mean, if a month and a half ago, they would have told you, all restaurants like were closed. You're not gonna. You were not gonna allow to leave your home. Or I'm from Spain. My family is stopped by the military when they go take the dog out, right? Which is like incredible. And we've adapted. So I'm sure we will invest in founders that we've only met through Zoom. But all that takes time, and and that's why it's been slower. And I think also, and we're past this this phase. That's why I, I say our thing, like what we say today, might just not be so applicable next week. Last week, I was talking a lot about how people were trying to process 
even their personal life and working at home with kids and like uh, all the bandwidth that that took from you that we're, we're used now it's a new normal so we just takes time for this situation to become the new normal but this is the short term in the long term i think that the situation looks positive we have money that we need to invest and we invest five to ten years from now so we're a little bit um protected from the short-term volatility so when this it when we all become comfortable with this situation being the new normal it will be back to business as usual right now it is there's business but it's much lower thank you Carmen. ed yeah. and just i would just so echo that thing about you know life is uh, moving very fast at the, at the moment and that sort of great Lenin quote that there are decades when nothing happens and then there are weeks that decades happen like we are in those weeks right now. Um, <clears throat> you know, and it's just, you know, we've got, you know, two companies in our portfolio that have gone to zero revenue. Um, we've got another one that's uh, usage has gone up 10 times and they found their sales cycle has gone from six months to 48 hours. And you're just seeing this huge volatility in, in sort of behavior. And um, there's just so much uncertainty that it's very, you know, every week makes a difference. Um, and I mean, just in terms of the government uh, sort of question, I guess um, we did a quick straw poll recently. I think, I mean, uh, 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 this is not like super scientific, but we think that 10% of our of the employees in our portfolio companies are on furlough at the moment. So the government is already supporting like a lot of startups um, indirectly through that, through that uh, here in the UK anyway. Um, we are aware of some, um, there, there's lots of lobbying going on at the moment. I mean, the cabinet office is obviously got people coming in left right and center asking for handouts for lots of like very important worthy initiatives and they're just trying to prioritize and figure out um how to do that but we're definitely aware of some schemes that might be announced over the next few weeks to, to um overlay on top of what's already out there so hopefully there's more good news um you know but from from our perspective you know talking about the wider fundraising environment um you know right now the last you know pwc just had a survey just did a survey of um, VCs in Europe, 25% uh, responded said they're not making any investments at the moment. Um, we just spoke to, um, it's very different, a half billion pound debt fund uh, that um, has got 100,000 SME customers. They stopped doing any lending five to six weeks ago. Um, and then we can see it in the market, like we've got companies that are fundraising. We, um, we actually just closed the deal last week. We closed one this week and we're hoping to close one next week. These are all things that were quite mature by the time it all got went really far south um and and we've got some other things that, that anyway we're so aware of what's going on and you know term sheets are being pulled um companies are not getting term sheets at all now um and and it's all completely irrational because you know as we sit here uh, and how on earth do you price something and you know what what plan are we backing so you know you said to go we're going to do this much revenue we're going to sign this many customers over the next nine to 12 months I'm like how on earth do you know that um and if you don't know what your revenue is, you know, what cost are you going to bring on and what cash you need? And it's just, you know, if you can wait two to three months until we have some certainty, then, then, then we know what plan we're backing and then we can price it. But at the moment, it's just so much uncertainty. Um, I think the behavior we're seeing is, is unfortunately completely rational by all, all the market participants. Super interesting on the back of what Ed uh, was saying. I'm picking up on one point uh, from Peter on, on three months not being enough. I think this idea of the fact that we investors cannot feel comfortable with any plan or any forecast and, and we cannot price it because we literally have no clue um, how we're, this whole situation is going to pan out and like the impact that that's, that's going to be. That also, guys, you should apply to yourself. So when you look at your runway, and how much money you have left for those that have raised money already be ultra conservative because any plan on revenue as ed was saying some companies are going to zero on the demand but others the problem is that they cannot serve the customers because of the supply chain disturbances like really be like it's much better to be very like not not be very pessimistic and act on it but to have different scenarios and contingency plans and understand that if you count your revenues for your runway you need to be very very conservative once you estimate that and you need to be pretty ruthless with potential growth and um, cuts with potential increasing churn like because we really don't know so um, make sure that you also take that into account and don't find yourself 
having less cash than you thought you did and having to raise in an environment that still hasn't get their head around what the post COVID-19 world looks like. I mean, that, that literally takes me to the next two questions. So I'm, I'm going to start first by focusing because everyone like in from, from, um, um, I guess the investment community, what we hear right now, our priority is our portfolio companies, right? Um, so I'm assuming that all of you saw that kind of focused on that over the past two weeks. And I guess what, if, if you could name like three of the most important sort of like kind of um, strategies that you advised your companies to sort of like kind of follow um, to, to over, overcome the outbreak, what, what would those three be? Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, so by far the most important is well-being of your staff. So, and this is because people are working from home generally, not everybody, because there's still laboratories and there's still key, key uh, industries which are working fully, but make sure that the staff that you've got, which aren't on furlough, because of course you can't in principle talk to them any longer. They, are, they, are, they, they can't volunteer back again. They can be paid for training apparently, but they can't do anything else. But everybody else, they, they use the term over communicate, just keep in touch with people, make sure they belong. And, 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 and obviously that varies between it, but I've seen some stellar examples within my portfolio and some not good ones as well. So that's the first thing. Second then, of course, is to replan, short-term replan. One of my portfolio, for instance, has phase, there's one, two, and three. Phase one is furlough the staff you can do. Um, none of them can really take loans out. Phase two is furlough the staff you really can't afford to furlough. <laughs> and stage three is sort of going to dormancy. So, um, and, and then on top of that, if you do ex need external capital, this depends on the runway, as Carmen said, it depends on where the revenue is coming from. I've got one end where we were doing 400k a month in March and we do naught now for the next few months. I've got another one that hasn't changed at all. I've got one that's turned over more in the last three or four weeks than it did in the whole of last year. That's a mask company, believe it or not. So, so um, is, is then work with your investors to find out if you do need some cash and, then, and base it on, again, back to Carmen, base it on sort of the worst case if you can and just have to take the hit on valuation if necessary. Founders, maybe not at the VC level quite so much, but certainly the angel level, we will support you with options. We want, if you are the right people to grow this business, we will make sure you're still covered. So if the valuation has to come down, it's the people who don't invest in that round that will suffer more than the founders. We make sure that happens. So communicate with the investors and then bring in some capital. But if you can afford to wait these three months, I'm, I'm just making this number up, which is there's no data. I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm just a you know patriarchal white male that's pontificating about something. <laughs> then wait the three months and, through until perhaps July, August time, which is about time to raise anyway. But I suspect investors will be um, pretty keen to help do that over that period. Then do that. So those are my three points. Thanks next. a lot, Peter. Who, who'd like to go next? You want to go ahead? I'm, I'm happy to go last. <laughs> okay, yeah, so, um, I guess, so a lot, most of the companies in our portfolio, um, you know, have got revenues, they are growing, um, I guess, you know, anywhere from 20 to sort of three, 400 employees, um, where we're the kind of the lead boys um, around the board table as investors. Um, and um, thankfully, you know, we, we, you know, we're just very lucky that no one is sort of just about to kick off a fundraising and has only got six months pay, payroll left. Um, so um, I, think, I think people needing, needing to raise money right now, there's, there's maybe a different sort of outlook at the moment. But for, for all the others, I mean, the advice we've been given is basically th this year is just about survival. In terms of your metrics and your growth and your valuation, like this year is just going to be a write-off. Um, no, no one's going to really kind of look at your trends and uh, how you've done year on year and uh, what your acquisition sort of uh, cost versus LTV are right at the moment. Um, because we're in such an unusual time, you can't read into it. So, um, you know, that will come further down the line. We'll get back to normal. So right now it is just about survival. And in that context, um, so, you know, we're mainly dealing with software companies that have recurring revenues, uh, you know, and annual subscriptions. So we've been saying, like, just assume um, no, no growth, no new customers. If you've got people signing right now, you know, fine, assume those come in. But beyond that, just assume nothing else comes in and assume that your churn doubles. Um, and and it, uh, that's just general advice. Of, of, I mean, those companies which are selling into the travel industry, um, uh, you know, the hotel industry or whatever, you know, I think are going to, you know, it needs to be more, more brutal uh, as well. But... Um, you know, just take a really pessimistic view on your on your revenues coming in, and then you just got to cut your cloth 
um, so that you've got at least 12 months, if not 24 months of runway, if you can. And I would say on average, um, we've seen leadership taking 20% pay cuts um, and then down below that, maybe 10%, 5%, depending on different levels. Um, we've seen a mixture of um, redundancies and furlough. Um, I mean, it's obviously desperately difficult for everyone involved. Um, and, um, and I think the advice within the companies has been like your, the two key areas you really need to focus on are your employees uh, and your customers. So, um, and then if you have time to just optimize your product in the meantime, you know, cause you've got some engineers, you don't want to let go um, uh, or, or whatever it is like, you know, this is the perfect time to just do that major upgrade. Um, I mean, sort of just as an anecdote, you know, we've got one company that um, sells software into the aviation industry and weirdly, you know, we were thinking they, they were going to have a really tough time, but actually all the planes are on the ground at the moment, not flying, which is the perfect time to do major upgrades of the, of the core software systems, all these planes. So, you know, there, there are these sort of product based um, decisions you can be making now rather than optimizing the UX and so on. So, um, so that's what people are doing. And, it, you know, it's just it's absolutely terrible. Um, but as Peter says, over communication, loving the employees, uh, and I think, you know, starting from the top, leadership taking, you know, showing by example what needs to be done and trying to get everyone in it together. You know, this is temporary. You know, in a year's time, people are going to be catching planes. They are going to be staying in hotels. Um, you know, they are going to be going out and listening to, you know, music and stuff. So, like, whenever it is, life is going to return to normal. It, you know, it won't be, uh, you know, we can debate when and we can debate what the economy looks like at that point in time. But, like, th there will be a, resu a resumption of normal day-to-day -day life. So it's about just getting to that point in time. Great. Um, so I'll echo a lot of what was said, but um, on the team, 100% and very little to add, um, just make sure that um, it is taken care of. It is a very difficult process and I've been helping founders with some of it to even send um, people to furlough, but just um, take care of that. And obviously cash is king as well. And as um, Ed was saying, be ruthless with your forecast. Cut now, now there's a balance because you cannot cut so much and this is much easier said than done, but you cannot cut so much that you hinder your growth and get into a spiral of not growing. So, but, but do be ruthless, put yourself in the worst case scenario and ensure, and this is what is really important, 18 to 24 months of runway, depending of, on how your sector is being had. But um, even if, as, as uh, Peter was saying, even if then it seems like, oh, you raised like um, you grabbed some extra 500k and the terms weren't so good you didn't you don't end up using those 500k just a million of the rest like at least you ensure you save it because the uncertainty right now is so much that you i wouldn't sail too close to the wind um just in case and also in that understand your cash and your if you have a business where cash and working capital is an issue and, and this doesn't need to be product based one as in like physical products. It can be one where you buy and sell and, and their credit facilities and rough. like just make sure you understand how much cash you have. Because one thing that I'm realizing from talking to a lot of colleagues and, and some companies of ours, they don't know how much cash they actually have if you take into account um, um, your um, your like supplier, how much you pay to your suppliers, what days you pay to your suppliers, how when you get paid, how much you're owed, and and again, um, this seems very basic. Make sure that you have it under control because it might it might be that you realize that uh, when the sales stop, suddenly like the effect on cash is doubled because you still need to pay your suppliers, right? So that and then just to end, two quick ones that people maybe don't tend to think so much about and because they um they we think a lot about the demand it's it's kind of natural but when you think about lockdown and also for uk companies uh, having seen what has happened in other parts in europe have contingency plans for your supply for a full lockdown this means a situation which in which all economic activity that is not critical gets stopped and I will tell you a story. Um, we have one company that is um, that basically um, sends um, low average order value gifts. It's it's like, and in Italy they they are like eight x year and year because people can't see each other, so they send each other little gifts. And the same in Spain. Now, when full lockdown came, 
in Italy, they couldn't, logistics is always a critical activity, but fulfillment, packing and fulfillment, packing, picking and packing is not always, right? So they moved to Spain and they were shipping flowers and gifts from Spain. Now, when Spain went into full lockdown, that was even more challenging. What do you do? Well, they agreed with a, a funerary service company to be channeling through them, right? And at the end in Spain, fulfillment is fine, but, but they, that idea of you guys understand that your supply chain might, might be cut completely and have a plan for it. And then also have a plan for your brand because there are going to be people that don't understand that you're doing business when the country is completely in lockdown, right? So do the same way you take care of your team, take care of your customers, explain to them what you're doing to keep your team safe, what you're doing to keep the people who like uh, supply you safe and, and make sure that everybody's up to speed. Thanks. Um, thanks a lot for that. And now going into um, actually investment, because um, if, if, if founders could get the, the cash from somewhere else, then that's, that's great for them. Um, but unfortunately, for, for a lot of the early stage um, companies, that's, that's not the case. So they're going to look at raising um, equity investment, right? Um, and I know it's not ideal, um, but if if you would advise, like, or what would you advise um, the founders that actually have to raise either from angels or from the VCs right now? Um, what, what would you advise them to do in order to actually be able to close? Um, yeah. Shall I start? Or, um, it depends whether it's, it's an initial, uh, it's a company that's just been set up or, or it's somebody who's raising more money. I assume you mean the former, don't you? You mean a company that's the idea has just been had and they're working together on a pack or something or deck. Is that right? It's, it's a combination. So, um, raising some, some of them, like let's, let's, let's take them, uh, let's take them separately because, um, I'm looking also at companies that, uh, probably had some sort of like revenue or some grants before, and they were just looking like before the outbreak to raise, um, their first, um, private investment. And like, obviously now that's not the, the best, like it's not looking very well. But what, like, what's your advice for them in that case? And then we can look at, um, at the second type of companies as well. Yeah, I mean, it's patience, unfortunately. And just have enough personal runway to be able to survive through because everything's going to slow down. That's what it's, all three of us are saying the whole time, isn't it? You just, it's going to wait. We just don't know what it's going to be like. I mean, the assumptions are that there will be a uh, increase in confidence in perhaps by the end of May or June time. Uh, this will then allow uh, more activity to occur. But you've got to also bear in mind, which hasn't been mentioned yet, at the angel level, a great deal of angels are uh, invested out of wealth that they will will have been reduced a huge amount in the last few weeks. You know, the stock markets have gone down 25, 30%. It can imagine, I'm, I'm not that, I'm an entrepreneur who's put my own wealth from the previous into it. I use the tax incentives, but they certainly I'm not driven by that. That's not the case of about 90% of angels in the UK who are driven by taxes. So the wealth is reduced. So what, so look at it that way. Your wealth is reduced by some number. It doesn't really matter what it is. Do you want to continue putting money into high risk startups? This is why, although I'm quite against it and many other people are against it as well, they were talking about increasing the EIS amounts then that would sort of effectively be a route into using government money. I, I think the, the optically that would be appalling that high net worths in a period of difficult time of being given more money by government. So, but it's just getting that money from the people like that is going to be really difficult, which means two things. One, it's going to take longer to raise the money. And secondly, you're going to have to be more choosy as an entrepreneur who you go to. You can't necessarily expect that a round will be filled by tax incentivized money. So the advice, comes back to the same as it will be unfortunately in all this call patience just wait and see let's have another call in a month's time or two months time or something and give you more so I'll, I'll answer i'll finish at that point and pass over to the other two yeah i think i i'd agree with that um like it just you know um by all means you know sort of build build relationships now and start but just you know try and push out as far as possible any sort of hard crunch conversations and the desire to get term sheets forward and, i mean just to again give it a bit more um sort of perspective i guess my sort of day-to-day -day life you know i guess i used to be uh maybe i'd have two pitches a day um you know uh, members of my team would, would have a lot more than that uh, and i've gone down from two pitches a day to one a week um and that's just you know, like people actually doing that they're realizing um that the um you know this is not a great environment i, I guess you could be a bit sort of um 
just contrarian and kind of go, well, look, you know, I, I, to be fair, the one the one I did have this week, I really remembered and paid a lot of attention to. It was the only one, as opposed to getting caught up in a busy day. So, um, so actually, in terms of sort of building relationship, it, it was quite good. But um, you know, the idea that I might take that to investment committee right now, I mean, um, as you said, there's so much uncertainty. Um, it, it just have to be um, something so strong um, that that it was, you know, I, I, you know, the top one percent of companies. We'll still be okay now because it's just very clear that um, you know that business is very strong. You know, so there are there are some sectors that are doing well at the moment. Um, there, you know, the VCs have got plenty of cash. I think um, the the last survey, I think by McKinsey or Bain had done this, having and seen that there's um, the dry powder available in sort of venture and growth funds uh, is enough to last two fundraising cycles. So there's plenty of cash available, and as soon as as soon as there is certainty, is what what's the economy look like? What does what what are the revenue forecasts look like, and are they believable? As soon as we get a level of certainty, people are going to be able to like assess the risk they're taking, and assess the reward they're likely to get in return for that risk. Um, but other anything right now is just complete guesswork. I agree, and I'll I'll be very sure. I think there's money we because of our model need to deploy that money eventually. So it's not like. Um, dry, but it's just going to take much longer. We're slower in making decisions. The incentive for um, running for a deal, for like getting excited for something new is, is harder to generate and, and we're being more selective. Um, I agree that there are things that might be obvious, be it for the space, be it because you know the founder. So um, there, there's a deal happening, a second time entrepreneur, we, like at the, we know the found fine, but it's very, those kind of selective cases will still continue to happen. The rest is just gonna take longer. And if it helps you all, it is the same on our side with our LPs. If you were to talk to any VC that is raising from LPs, it is the same. The money is there. They will invest in new funds. It's just taking slower because people need to get their head around a lot of things before they can feel comfortable pricing something. Which is, of course, why government could get involved in the way that they're printing money or maybe printing money or to distribute. As you say, Carmen, the, the British Business Bank is put, potentially putting together a fund which will be co-investing with people. I don't know whether you've had BBB money or, or whatever, but if you have, the, I think you'll be given a chunk of cash to go along with that. That seems the way that things are going. Yeah. So that, that, that takes me to, um, to the next question, which is like, what, what do you folks think of coin? I mean, that sort of kind of type of co-investment, um, either with like under the sort of kind of runway fund um, initiative or with like someone like Innovate UK, would, would you be open to it? Or like, um, what, what's your opinion on that? I, I mean, won't go first this time. You start yeah. first, Ed, yeah. <laughs> I was very quick. I just come back to a comment I made earlier, which I think at the moment it's about survival. Um, so like, if you don't have to raise, don't. If you do, you just, you know, close it. If you have an offer, take it. Um, close as quickly as you can if you're in the middle of the discussion. Um, you know, it's about, it's about getting into a position where you're fighting for another day. And actually, Carmen, you made a good point earlier as well about, you know, cut the cost where you can, but not, not so much that you can't sort of bounce back when, when life does look a bit better. Um, but, you know, so if you have offers of government funding or grants or anything like that, I mean, you just grab them with both hands. And, you know, the, the, the machinery of the government in the background is kind of anything that's out there is being encouraged to be more flexible. You know, R&D tax credits are moving much more quickly. Um, various other sort of approvals were well seem to be, you know, being processed more quickly. So, um, you know, the, the, all avenues should be pursued. Yeah, I mean, uh, I see comments off for the moment. I'll, I'll come in now. Yeah, it just it is survival. Think about it. If your business doesn't survive, what are you going to do at that point? I mean, and the process. I've had businesses go bust on me. I've, I've obviously had investments go bust on me. The toll, the psychological toll on the founders is huge. Obviously, on the staff as well. So, if you can survive, providing you still got the passion there as well. Bear in mind, the new world will be somewhat different. It may well be there are things that we've been worked on by startups at the moment will be less relevant in the future. Obviously, I haven't got a crystal ball any better than anybody else, but providing you're passionate about what you're doing, just survive, bring the money in somehow. I couldn't agree more. I think that uh, 
please don't like take any money and then come want to kill us because six months from now the world looks rosy and you took that money at terms that, that uh, now look like six months from now look um, not favorable. I think with the, being the uncertainty as it is, if you need the money, any money, just take it. That can increase your runway. And I'll tell a personal story. A very good friend of mine um, has quite a successful startup. They were racing Series B. They were talking to one of the top tier funds um, in, in Europe for a very large Series B. And um, then they told them, we're still interested, but right now we can't invest, like put on hold. And then the existing investors offered to, to do a bridge. And she was discussing with me the size of the bridge. And she was like, yeah, but then you think if we take X it's too much. What if we don't use it? I was like, well, right now, the kind of opportunity cost of taking it at conditions that might not be as good as they would have been if COVID wouldn't have existed, and then you're not using it is so much lower than the opportunity cost of running out of cash or the risk of running out of cash that, yeah, it's survival, right? Do whatever it takes to survive, and it will be well done. Yeah. So Ed just agrees with that as well. Um, so by how much would you um, would you think that devaluations have have dropped over the the past few weeks? I know I know it's kind of like hard to say, but based on what you've seen um, and from the conversations with your portfolio companies as well, um, like do would you be able to sort of like kind of yeah give not oh. enough, like. Of, I guess yeah, but, at, the, at the angel level people and this doesn't apply to me but people are saying well I've lost 30% of my wealth in the stock market dropping therefore I want the, the valuation of that be less there is a correlation between valuations of non-floated companies and floated companies as we see I mean modified by all kinds of things like liquidation preferences before they go onto the market so that is the number I've heard personally I will wouldn't take that number I think I, I, we're taking Cambridge a much more sanguine approach in that we are we will continue to invest and we won't punish the founders if we really believe in the business however of course that and that, that I've only actually seen I haven't seen any term sheets pull I've only seen one angel actually pull out once the legals was done so which is all, still a nuisance because the legals need re-signing uh, otherwise this behavior has been very good so but I will go back to what I said before in fact we've all said before if it's possible not to have the valuation fixed to this point, then try and move it down the line. I have heard actually, I was on the phone to Treasury last week on the Monday, that although we sort of thought in our industry that ASA, these advanced share purchases, had been reduced to a six month runway, that's not the case. It is still 12 months. 12 months doesn't sound quite long enough at the moment, but of course it's very much better than six months. So if you can do a, a convertible loan using ASA, with an ASA, which all decent lawyers can do, then at least you've delayed that for the 12 months. Not longer than 12 months, so 12 months is still next summer. But by then we should have a lot more clarity. Yeah, I think um, at the VC level, in full honesty, we haven't seen a big hit in valuations the same way that if you look at the data, it doesn't really show a, like a total drop in the number of deals. But that's because, as Ed was saying before, a lot of the deals that are happening now come from long ago. They were kind of agreed. So a lot of the things that we're closing now were fixed back then. And I think most people are holding behavior. I mean, there's some scary stories out there, but in general, um, people are hold, like kind of respecting those terms or negotiating them with founders in the for, in a framework of, of, of common sense. So we haven't seen that hit now. I have um, been reading kind of survey sentiments and stuff. It is expected that they drop at least, going back to Peter's point, around 30%. The future 30 to 60, which again, it is, um, I mean, 60% is very extreme, but uh, it is true that we came from a time of unprecedented high valuations that actually also made no sense and many times made very little favor to founders. So I think before there was this race to the highest valuation, not understanding that then the business needed to grow into that and probably double the valuation for the next round and that sometimes that was really really difficult so hopefully we get somewhere that um is still like founders get a fair valuation and probably um kind of the ability to build healthier business over a more sustainable basis than some of the behaviors that we were seeing pre-covid 
Yeah, and I'd have to, I'd say um, we're aware of quite a few deals um, that have kind of come back 20 to 30%. Um, and that fe it feels about right if you look at what's going on in the market. Um, and, and these are for sort of later stage businesses where you, like, you do know what the revenues are going to be because it's already been booked and this is you know, annual recurring revenue and you have a sense of what's coming through. Um, uh, but I mean, as a sort of slightly um, more abstract point though, like the, the valuation sensitivity becomes greater the, the later stage the company is for, for a couple of reasons. So, um, you know, like when you're, if you're investing at seed stage in a very deep tech business, like a good outcome might be 20 or 30 times your money. Um, whereas if you're investing in a growth equity deal, you know, with 20 million of revenue, a good outcome might be three times your money. So, um, the, the, the later stage you are, like you have much less room in order to make a return that's going to mean that you sustain your investors, make money, and you raise another fund again in the future. So actually a 20% difference in the valuation for a late stage investor is a big, big, big deal. And those deals, are, from what I can understand, those are all being repriced without exception, um, even if term sheets were agreed pre-COVID. Um, at, the, at the very kind of seed, very first check into a company, C stage, I mean, uh, you know, it's, it's a bit more, I mean, and Peter, you, I'm sure you're telling me there's a lot more science to it than this, but it's a bit more like, well, 20% stake for the money going in feels about right. Um, you know, this company could be worth whatever if it succeeds. That means I'll get this much return. You know, it all feels about right. Um, and that doesn't necessarily, that doesn't particularly change to do with the fact, I mean, obviously what the value is potentially worth at exit, you know, is, is an important factor in that calculation, but that's the, that's the exit value in five to seven years time, not, not the exit value next year. Uh, yeah. yeah, I've got to disagree, Ed, just briefly <laughs> from experience. And I like disagreements on the panel because it gets the audience more engaged. Uh, but I've actually disagreed for, because I believe what I'm saying, not just to push back on you. Most, in, most exits in the UK of early stage companies are between five and 15 or five and 20 million pounds. Therefore, if you invest at too high a valuation to start with, the journey will carry on up and there'll be a down round or two at the end. It, it, by down round, I mean you'll be exiting for less than the previous valuation. So if you're going to build a portfolio, you don't want too many less than one X's on the cash that goes in. So starting at too high a valuation, the biggies will go for 20 or 30 X, but most thing goes for one, two, three, four X something like that. And of course, some of the later stage money is less than that. So I strongly believe that one shouldn't invest at too high a valuation. But we could argue about this all afternoon though. Actually, actually I think you, you did correctly pull me up on the 20, 30 times. So, but, but, I, but, the, but the other point though, which is there's a sort of an assumption of what the exit value is and therefore you need to get in at a certain price. It's not quite so sensitive to the sort of um, month to month or even year to year sort of fluctuations. And then the, I guess the last point um, about this is like, the later stage the business is, the more metrics you have. Um, so when you're first going on, it's a lot of art and a little bit of science. And by the time you're a FTSE 100, uh, you know, global business, it's a lot of science and a little bit of art. And then there's just a spectrum in between. And the more science you have in your valuation calculation at the moment, the more you're going to be adjusting to what's going on in the wider market. Um, th thanks for, a lot for that. Um, one, of, one of the questions from, um, from, from the audience is, um, because you, you've all said that you're still looking and assessing deals. Um, did your investment criteria change in any way, or do you think that will change because of the, 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 the um, current outbreak? And if so, how would, or how did it change? So I, I think being a seed, like pre-series A investor, um, obviously kind of the team is the biggest driver. That hasn't changed. I think we're learning a lot about the founders in our portfolio and founders in other companies and probably what we're learning about things to look for in people that successfully rise up in, in times of crisis. But we still look for the same um, kind, of, kind of things when, when looking at teams. Um, the second part being kind of the market and the market opportunity, I think that it is early days to see, to say how we think the world's going to look in post-COVID. You have very big macro trends, like there's obviously going to be a shift offline to online and a lot of the adoption curve in a lot of things like remote work, for example, have accelerated, but you, we, we don't intend to kind of now focus on all those kind of post-COVID because you also don't know what the medium to long-term impact of, of that is really going to be and when the dust settles, how, how it's going to look, right? And for business, um, I think that 
we basically, I mean, we're thematic by business model. We will continue looking at, at, at um, digital platforms and platforms. We will probably, and, and we're so early that we, there's a lot of art and, and very little science in, in what we can ask for, but we will probably watch out more for cash dynamics and stuff. But honestly, not really, like, I don't think we're changing our investment thesis. We're updating our themes and trends because the world has changed and we need to understand how, how the world's gonna look in order to be able to price uh, companies and believe their plans but i don't think it has changed per se our investment thesis as such i go next thank you uh, no i haven't changed my investment criteria at all i'm pretty open if anybody looks at my website petercaller.org you can see all the criteria on there a b2b deep tech lots of other things about 16 criteria and, and i wouldn't change that either because like carmen at the very early stage we don't really invest in businesses as such we invest in people so they need to have a plan and they need to be credible plan but it's whether we can it's i, I like it to sort of buying a future in the human beings the team pretty horrible way of looking at it but that's what it basically is will they have the ability to take the money and use it prudently to grow that money are they the right people to do that so in fact the criteria shouldn't change if you look forward when we've worked on what this new normal is a, a, a given example of the business i'm on the board of is thinking of getting rid of its offices in central london half a million a year that costs half a million down to the bottom line of a company that's turning over just under 10 million it's a huge amount of money so you know there will be i'm not i would never go into property anyway though i have done some property deals in the past but when i've looked at what the new normal which is a terrible phrase and i hope journalists actually come up with a better term at some point the new world order or something post covid world order. yeah the b b the b c and a c they call it don't it? before covid and after COVID. remember it's covid 19 and we may have a covid 21 or 23 or 25 so that's a, that's a horrible thought. So yeah, I'm, I'm sure at that point, uh, later in the year, beginning of next year, then I'll start to think about my investment criteria somewhat. Um, yeah, I, I just added sort of a few things. I think, um, so assuming, we're, you know, no one's raising right now, in which case, if you're a video conferencing app, great. Otherwise, you know, it's going to be tough. Um, but when, like, when, when life returns to some sort of normality, I mean, you know, we're going to be in a recessionary environment. So that, you know, it does mean that I think um, discretionary spend is going to be under, uh, under a bit more pressure. So, pressure. So I would have thought, you know, obvious things in sort of travel and leisure and so on, you know, will, will, won't be quite the um, shape they were before. Um, in, in terms of sort of, you know, things that become attractive, you know, I think there's sort of everyone, like loads and loads of people are now working remotely and working from home and doing it, like their day-to-day -day lives have suddenly changed. Um, and, um, and that's going to change how a lot of businesses work. I mean, just looking at the banks, you know, one of the biggest sort of spenders uh, on technology, you know, they're suddenly finding their call centers in the Philippines and India and stuff are just shut and they can't use them. And the bits of their business that had automated some of those processes and just made them more efficient suddenly are, are performing and the other, the other bits are struggling. Anything where, which involves like writing down the things on pieces of paper and passing them to the person sitting next to you in the office, like those processes are struggling and they're going to need automating um and um and then the other so i mean that's a sort of a pet theory at the moment and we, we are seeing a little bit of that at the moment some some of the banking um priority spends that are holding up at the moment are to do with optimization and efficiency um and then the last thing i would say is uh we would we expect that the unit economics and cash intensity of growth is going to be a greater focus so although it, you know people should get back to funding um, companies again before too long in a fairly similar fashion, whatever the valuation is at the time. Um, the idea that, well, as long as your top line is growing at whatever, like the amount it costs for it to grow doesn't, doesn't matter so much because we'll be able to raise some money um, to fund that. So that, I think that world is, um, we have to assume is not the same as it was. Um, being able to fund growth through easy availability of money is, is not going to be out there. And also, you know, if valuations have dropped by 30%, then any money you raise is that much more expensive. Um, so, you know, to fund that growth, it costs more because you, you need equity to go and fund it. So, um, so you know, I think we, we see a lot more focus on, um, you know, acquisition ratios, LTV to CAC and so on. Um, I, 
I agree 100%. I'll just add one thing, not for fundraising, but for, um, for because for fundraising, I 100% agree and, and it all applies. And it's very still macro trends what, in the sense of what can become interesting and, not, and what cannot become interesting. But if you're in one of these sectors that um, has been hit and that expects to be hit um, in the in the medium term if there's a recession, like be it retail or yeah, mainly retail, fashion, all that. Just think also that probably it shouldn't affect you, even if so. Fashion company online now, even if fashion per se drops a lot, you because of being online and the size that you most likely have still have so much room to grow you can probably keep up very healthy levels of growth even if the overall market is shrinking because the the trend the online trend and just the the, the marriage of your size will drive you through so i think that is something to keep in mind and and to be um still a bit optimistic it's like even if you're in markets that might be really hit you can still do very well. And, and we are seeing some companies that, that are in the fashion and accessories thing doing still very well because they, they're basically a drop in the ocean. If the ocean becomes smaller, you can still grow in the ocean, so to say, a little bit. Um, thanks a lot for that. Just looking at the, the questions from, um, from the audience, um, one that came through is like, so, Assuming you have no angel investor contacts and you're um, a pre-seed, in this case, fashion brand, but feel free to sort of like kind of open it up to, I would say, like any sort of like kind of type of um, tech startup, um, where would be the best place to start looking for an angel investor? In competitors and relevant startups. Like, I mean, if you, especially if you're fashion, um, definitely a, a lot of precedents to buy. I would go and look at the cap tables of similar companies or, or not similar companies in the space. And, and that will give you an indicator of who's investing uh, in those. That might be a good way to, to go about it. Yeah, that's an interesting idea there, Carmen. Uh, yeah, I mean, there are obviously apparently about 70 angel groups in the UK, and that's usually the best best way in if you're not going through a crowdfunding site. If it was a B to C, then some of you know, the crowd cubes or cedars will give you product champions if they invest. I suspect for the moment both those organizations are really struggling. Um, but otherwise, if you can find a, an angel group which is specific, whether it's like, if it, I mean, tech, I know, well, life sciences or whatever. Um, in fashion, there'll be some group, I suspect, in London somewhere or perhaps Manchester doing that. So go through the group. In the end, it, as an angel investor, I expect my entrepreneurs to be able to um, work this sort of thing out. So approach directly to angels specific. And as Carmen says, coming off the shareholder register or cap table of a, of a competitive, or not necessarily competitive, but a company in the same sort of space, is a really good start. And then just reach out to them whatever way. I've had things come through the post even to me directly. I've obviously had tweets, I've had LinkedIn requests, etc. cetera. Um, but to find a group is, is probably the best way in. In the end, you're going to have to, this is part of one of the tests of building a business. If you need equity, if you can pass that test, you probably pass some of the further tests. Yeah, um, yeah. I was just going to add a sort of an anecdote building on from something that Carmen said there. So, I, you know, like building your syndicate and like getting the people in there that you think can be helpful, um, you know, it's just a critical part of building a business. Um, and I just wanted to share an anecdote. Now I heard this secondhand. Um, I, I love this story so much. I really hope it's true. And I do believe the person who told me did say he heard it from Demis himself. But so when Demis Hassabis um, raised uh, his first round of funding for uh, DeepMind, you know, it, um, he basically raised it from Peter Thiel, who back then was like the person you would want to raise uh, angel funding for a deep tech investment, you know, uh, you know the, at the center of everything. Uh, and everyone was sort of like, um, you know, obviously frustrated that the UK tech scene didn't, like tech investment scene, didn't get to participate in the success of DeepMind, but also like deeply impressed, like how on earth did you know, this master's student from UCL uh, go and raise money from all these like amazing, um, you know, sort of uh, techerati, I guess you'd say, over on the West Coast. And so supposedly um, he decided that um, Peter Thiel was the person he wanted to raise money from. Um, uh, and like, you know, completely unfunded this point with no money, saw that Peter Thiel had just written zero to one and was doing a book signing in a bookshop in California, in San Francisco. And so flew to San Francisco and then queued up to get his book signed along with, and then along with everyone else, um, 
was just waiting for that that book to be signed and every, everyone else was going and they had their 30 seconds while they'd been signed like pitching their startup to peter while, while he was signing all these books and then apparently he went up to him and said um by the way did you know that the reason the chess is the the best game out there is because of the knight move and then and then had it signed and just stood in the corner and it was a, like it just sort of apparently was playing away in the back of peter's mind to the point where afterwards he said what, what was that you just said about the knight move which is all at the core of his sort of approach to generalized artificial intelligence. It led to a conversation that led to an investment. But, but I mean, talking about a way to go and catch exactly the person you want to go and invest and have on your cap table, that's, that's probably uh, one of the most uh, sort of interesting stories I had. But like you do hear time and time again, like people fighting super hard to get the people involved in their business. And um, Peter, you know, like Andy Phillips has got the story about how he got his chairman into active hotels, which still has ended up being the most successful startup to come out of Europe. Um, you know, and, and he just, you know, camped outside this person's door for weeks and weeks and weeks until eventually he got the meeting and eventually got, got him involved. Um, and, you know, that sort of behavior in the current environment is just going to be required even more. Well, yeah, in fact, Active Hotels, for those who don't know, became Booking.com. Um, and Andy Phillips, I've, I've done about 70 or 80 podcasts and I've done a couple with Andy Phillips. I, I will offline talk to you about the, the story you've just given because I actually know somebody invested before Peter Thiel. Oh, right, okay, right. <laughs> but I won't prick your balloon on, on, on air. So. <laughs> I'll, I'll take um, a final question from, from the audience just because it's already 5 p.m. And then we're going to go into sort of like kind of closing remarks um, and, and that's going to be it for the day. Um, I, I have a feeling that I know the answer for this, but it's been the fourth voted um, question. So I'll just kind of shoot it your way. Um, what impact would taking a Sybil's loan have um, to an investor at like the next sort of kind of investment um, 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 level, if any, um, what's, what's your opinion on that? Oh, I'll jump in first. I mean, A, positive in terms of the uh, initiative of the entrepreneurs. Um, and the level I'm investing, uh, many of these companies don't have much revenue, so they, would, they wouldn't get a loan. I mean, I was just reading about the Swiss system where 15 billion francs went out in the first seven days from announcing this. In the UK, 140,000 loans requests in the first two weeks and 983 went out. Obviously, we've got it completely wrong not just the government and banks, so something's wrong in the way we're giving those loans out. So positive in terms of getting the loan out, not so positive in terms of how it's going to repay, because of course that's, you know, hopefully it'll come out of cash flow. I wouldn't like it to come out of equity. I wouldn't like them to have raised money in order to pay off the loan. But as I say, I've got much less experience with this than I'm sure Ed has or, or Carmen, because it, it doesn't really apply to most of my portfolio. Yeah, it applies to none of my portfolio, I think. Uh, the, the terms to, to raise are, are not um, accessible to, to many of our companies. So. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think you come back to a theme, you know, we dwelt on earlier about survival. Like if this is a difference between, you know, surviving or not, then you take it. But um, generally speaking, OT investors don't like investing money to go and pay out other people. But, you know, we are in exceptional times and there might be, you know, there's always, a, you know, situations that you need to adjust for. But um, a, as a rule, it's, it's not, not what we like doing. Um, thanks, thanks a lot for that. And I, I don't know, like any, any final um, closing remarks, like anything else that you'd like to, to advise um, any startup founder out there either looking to raise now or over the next few months? Um, yeah, any, anything in particular that you'd like to, to, to um, send across? I think that um, our job today was also to be as open as, as possible and, and, and as honest and, and, and put people in the kind of worst um, case scenario so that um, you, we like make sure that we've done our bit to so you're prepared whatever the world come uh, the, whatever the world brings right um but the reality if you think about um our model and i hinted it um, a bit before is that medium to long term the money is the money is there we will have to deploy it and we get very used to the new normal the post covid world and its conditions right and the ability to adapt of the human mind it's incredible so what might seem completely impossible like investing over zoom might become a reality three weeks from now and so i just think that it is the timing 
what is um, a bit tricky now and that the very short term is too early. Things are moving too slow and investors are being too selective. But because of the asset class that we work with, they should go back to normal quicker than than other in other industries now i would say though that what we don't control and what we don't know is the macroeconomic impact of what this is going to happen so the direct impact on your business fundraising aside so in that be ruthless and, and make sure that you're covered for for the worst case not for, yeah not because you need to raise money just because you need to survive and and so just make sure that you're not over optimistic we all tend to be optimistic you founders us <laughs> vcs i think it's time to be a bit ruthless and and put yourself in the worst case scenario and if the world then or the situation is better well welcome be it but um it's better than being caught in the opposite uh, side of things yeah i, I would just say um you know, there's a sort of adage that, um, you know, it's the best companies that are founded and you know, like grow out of the difficult times. Um, and like, you know, it's just the hell of the cry. I mean, we all feel it as investors, um, not not as much as the people in the companies, but I mean, my God, do we actually sort of live and breathe some of the pain that uh, people we work very closely with all the time um, suffer. And you know, it is absolutely horrific. And I, you know, I do worry about the kind of the mental health of some of the people, you know, I know well, and it is desperately difficult um you know but it you know th there's obviously an existential risk of a systemic collapse you know you listen to um you know what's happening to the supply chain you know the, the industries in africa that have all just completely stopped and these are people that live hand to mouth and so on but you know it you know we are you know like china's stock market is only down 10 percent um there are parts of asia that are beginning to return to normal um you know it we pro it probably is as bad as it's going to get now in terms of level of uncertainty um, and knowledge. You know, we do have global resources pointed at one problem, which is to get people uh, healthy, um, tested, get the, you know, get the world back to normal. You know, it will work at some point in time. And um, it always reminds me of this great sort of Winston Churchill quote, which is, um, he always uh, pity people that never uh, had a hangover because when they woke up in the morning, that was as good as the day was going to get. And I feel that that's kind of that's kind of where we are now. Like, you know, it can't get worse, and it's only going to get better. Um, so, you know, it's about fighting the fires, getting through this moment, and then it, and it should, at some point, life's going to improve, and it should, hopefully won't be too far. Good. So I'm left with the last word. I think I just add to that. And, uh, I, I, for, I haven't had an alcoholic drink for 20 years, so I cannot remember what it was like to have. <laughs> I needed to stop drinking. I'm quite quite open about that. Three things really. I think we all I'm doing is summarising: patience, survival, and protecting your own and other people's mental health. Those are the main things. So patience. Just be patient. You know, this will take time. Whether it's the three or four months or the or the year or so. Survival. Stay alive. You know, stay in the. I mean, financially survival there, and then protecting your own mental health your own physical health and that of your employees. Thanks. Thanks a lot, everyone. Um, thanks, Ed, Peter, um, and, and Carmen. And thanks a lot to all of our attendees today. Um, I hope that um, the webinar answered um, your questions around um, fundraising and the investment landscape. And as promised, we will follow up with you um, with an email to um, give you access to the recording of, of the webinar today. Um, so thanks a lot, everyone. And I guess have a lovely rest of the evening and enjoy the Easter holiday. Stay safe and yeah, yeah. stay safe. Stay safe and sane, everybody. Yeah. Bye. 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 Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Julia. Yeah, thanks. Bye, guys. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, bye.